Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are um, as you're attending this webinar. We're really, really delighted that you joined us. Uh, my name is Anthony Chow, the director of the San Jose State High School. Uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to the second installment of the iSchool Speaker Series uh, and, uh, and final um, uh, activity and celebration of Hispanic Heritage uh, Month. Uh, the school, the iSchool is committed to understanding and honoring the incredible diversity of our nation, and we're delighted to present you with today's speakers. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to honor and celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month by providing such high quality programming. Um, and we have a big uh, event also planned for Native American Heritage Month uh, starting in November as well. So I wanted to thank uh, my colleague, um, Michelle Villagran, uh, who has uh, uh, is also the chair of our diversity committee and helped us organize uh, today's session. So let me turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. So again, I'm, I'm Dr. Michelle Villagran, the chair of the iSchool Diversity Committee and assistant professor in the School of Information. And I also want to welcome you to today's webinar, Collaborating for Success, a Hispanic Heritage Month case study. This is being recorded and the recording will be available on our iSchool YouTube channel. And we have a diversity playlist where all of our webinars related to diversity live. So I will place that link in the chat momentarily. If you do have questions, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat throughout. So please place your comments, questions, ideas, resources, anything you'd like to share with attendees in the chat. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today. Nicanor Diaz, Neighborhood Services or Immigrant Services Manager, and Nadia Rendon, Spanish Services Coordinator with the Biblioteca Pública de Denver, Denver Public Library. They will chat with us about how to successfully leverage collaboration. So this is really focuses on, focusing on collaborations to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. I will now turn it over to Nicanor. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, uh, Dr. Chow, for um, inviting us to share our experience on uh, this fantastic Hispanic Heritage Month program that we've done this year. Uh, and okay, so again, my name is Nick Diaz, Neighborhood Services Manager for the Denver Public Library. I'm also an Immigrant Services Manager as well. Um, I'm going to let Nadia now briefly introduce herself, and then I'll come back to kind of give an outline of the presentation and what we're going to be talking about today. And then Nadia and I will just kind of take turns highlighting some of the events that we've done this past month and highlighting the collaboration that we've done with internal departments and community, uh, community partners. And um, then we'll just have some time for all of you to be able to ask us some questions. Nadia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us. My name is Nadia Rendon and I'm the Spanish Services Coordinator uh, for the Denver Public Library, the Biblioteca Pública de Denver. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so I want to give a little bit of, of historical context before we start with um, our presentation. And um, I want to talk about a couple of things. I, I've been with the Denver Public Library since 2014, so it's been a little over seven years now. And um, this is actually, since I started working at the library, I think this is one of the 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 most well-received Hispanic Heritage Month program series that we have done. It hasn't always been this like this. Um, and I wanna share some of the struggles that we had in the past and how we got to where we are today. Uh, to give you an idea, Nadia's position is, is relatively new, newish. I think we created it maybe about four years ago. Um, as the Spanish services coordinator. Um, and she can talk a little bit more about her role within the system. But uh, so keep that in mind with this position didn't exist um, before. Uh, along with the creation of Nadia's position, we also created a, an internal working group that's called the Spanish Customer Experience Team, which is a group comprised by various staff members throughout the library where we take a, a real close look at what is the experience of a Spanish speaker 
when they use the library. And that's covering all different types of usage, whether it's calling a branch to renew an item, whether it's accessing our online resources, programming. We looked at that as a whole and looked at where we had gaps and where there were opportunities for improvement, which one of those areas was programming, again, in the context of leading to this amazing Hispanic Heritage Month program. Uh, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about that we have never, we haven't always done things the right way. Um, this next story that I'm going to share, I'm ashamed that, I, that I'm actually sharing this, um, but I think it is a learning moment because um, this is what happens when we have departments within our library systems that work in silos and don't collaborate and assume that they are experts in everything. Uh, four to five years ago, our communications and community engagement department or our marketing department, which is in charge of creating an, uh, this Engage magazine, which has a list of all of the programs that the library offers, decided that it would be a great idea on the cover of their October Engage magazine to have the picture of a person with Dia de los Muertos uh, makeup on. And as the caption write, boo, it's scary, and this is Halloween. And uh, I was deeply embarrassed that our library system would produce this and share it on Facebook. And I think it was one of our most commented Facebook posts because people were just very upset that the library would produce this. And none of us knew that this was happening. So here we have a department that's in siloed and didn't reach out that decided that this would be a good idea. And, and it wasn't obviously, but we learned from that. Um, and also another reason why we're focusing on Hispanic Heritage Month is uh, because libraries have, I believe that libraries owe their entire community services and programs and that includes our Spanish speaking community. And we need to make sure that everyone, that we provide access to resources and materials and services to everyone in our library system, in our community, regardless of what language they speak. We know that this isn't often the case. Um, I used to work for another library system that they, often the message would be like, well, they don't use the library, so why should we, divert our resources to serving them if they don't use the library. And I feel like what, what we're going to talk about today really demonstrates that we are the ones who have to try and put resources into connecting with our Spanish-speaking communities. And it's not that they don't use the library because they don't want to. It's most likely because the library is really not connecting with the Spanish-speaking community and we're not producing the services and programs that they need. And in order to find out what that is, we have to build a relationship with that community and we have to collaborate with them. So hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that today in this webinar. Go ahead, Nadia. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Nicanor. Mm. Uh, I wanted to show the what Nicanor was talking about. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and I'm going to share the post that Nicanor was talking about that was very culturally insensitive. This is the one you were talking about Nicanor, right? Yeah, that's the one. So we did this in October and we're saying it's a spooky month ahead and we're talking about Halloween and the image reflects doesn't reflect that and it was it, through some of the comments it was just incredible and I'm glad that they kept it up just as a reminder of how bad things can go when we don't collaborate um, for success. Okay, well, thank you, Nicanor, for that introduction of the 
and history of Hispanic heritage month with the library, member public library. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little about the, uh, the whole dynamic that brought us to have a very successful Hispanic Heritage Month uh, in DPL, Denver Public Library. At the beginning of the year, or maybe at the end of last year, Nikanor uh, is my supervisor. So he said that the Communications and Community Engagement Department wanted to highlight some Hispanic Heritage Month, um, actually the whole month from September 15 to October 15. And we wanted to do something big this year because last year, because of the pandemic, we had one program, which was an online program. We had hired a DJ to play from a, a brewery, from a Latino brewery. And that was the only thing we did for Hispanic Heritage Month. So we really wanted to come back like with the you know, full strength. Mm, so when he asked me if I wanted to take the lead on this effort, of course I say yes. And um, it is worth mentioning that when we started planning this month, we were not offering any in-person programs and everything was still in the air. Even now, the library is not offering many in-person programs, mm, but we, we are, but not many. So this was like a one like a very special thing for us, for our department, for the cultural inclusivity department, and for, uh, of course, for Spanish services. In April, uh, I invited the community to, I made the call to invite the community, not the community, the, the Denver Public Library System uh, through our staff webpage to join a task force. And many people answered the call, they emailed me, they even called me, hey, I wanna be part of this. And I invited them to like an initial uh, brainstorming meeting. In this meeting, we had stuff from many departments and positions. Uh, we had teen services, adults and older adult services, early learning, librarians, shelvers, and other staff from different branches. And the ideas started to flow. So we talked about having like salsa classes, arts and craft, tours, concerts, food, and many more, many more things. And anybody who wanted to commit to do something had the, the opportunity to do it. One of our newest librarians in the system came up with this idea, a bilingual library card. Uh, I think he is in the, uh, uh, he's watching this right now. So Nicolas, hi. So originally we thought about having a design contest by local artists, but because of time constraints, we didn't. And this librarian, his name is Nicolas Cabrera, he worked on selecting the design. He, he partnered with the community, uh, uh, community communication and community engagement department. Uh, and to get the right design, he worked with our graphic designers and the community, the communications department worked for the work on the new wording for the back of the cards. Uh, we work on translating it in a way that was easy and friendly to read because we didn't want to have like lots of wording in such a small piece of uh, plastic. Uh, the, and also the manager of the books and borrowing department agreed to pay for uh, the, the printing of these cards. So it was like a partnership between different, different departments. Uh, the planning, oh, there is Nicolas saying hi. <laughs> Uh, the planning took time and effort and partnership among different departments, but at the end, we were able to offer our community not only a month full of programs, events, activities, and we we're also able to offer the first bilingual card offered by Denver Public Library. Mm. And I'm reading on the chat, the Spanish-only card is a great idea. Um, so what we did, we distributed and we promoted this library card from September 15th to October 15th. And then we took it away. 
So we're going to bring it back next year until all the cars, until all the cars uh, run out. Mm. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, I don't know exactly how many cars were given out yet, but we will share them later with you. Um, that's one of the things we need to improve too, because our supplies department who supplies the cars and supplies and supplies, uh, yeah, all the design, different designs, the regular ones and the Hispanic Heritage Month library cards, uh, they only deliver once a uh, week. Um, so for next year, it's a promise, I will take care of the uh, distribution myself because we run out of some branches and we were sharing with among branches. Uh, the most popular design was the flex design. Oops, where am I? Yeah, here. Um, so I'm gonna pass this to Nicanor. Uh, this was one of the first programs that we have at the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month and was also hosted by Nicolás Cabrera, the same person who came up with the idea of the library cards. Nicanor. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I just wanna mention that those library cards were super, super, super popular. And um, we had them at display at all the branches. And when we would do programs like the genealogy one that I'm gonna talk a little bit about now, um, folks would see those library cards and just want to get a new library card. They, they were willing to replace their old one so they could have the new design. Um, and it's definitely one of the things that we'll continue doing for future Hispanic Heritage Months. Um, so one of the programs that we, we worked on during the Hispanic Heritage Months was a genealogy program that again, Nicolás Cabrera, who was very involved in Hispanic Heritage Month programming, um, decided to, to take on. Um, I do believe we do have a, a genealogy, a Western history and genealogy department out of our central library. Um, however, and Nicolás can correct me, I don't think that we had ever done a genealogy program in Spanish for Spanish speakers. So this is a good example of how we can leverage the uh, expertise that our staff have and collaborate with branches to come up with unique programs. He, he, he says, correct, it was the first genealogy workshop at DPL. Because again, we take it back to that notion that Spanish speakers are our community as well and our customers. And if we are providing English only genealogy programs, then we're not doing justice to our Spanish speaking communities. And we should be able to, to provide those, particularly in this area where we know that genealogy work is so important for Spanish families and Spanish speaking our Spanish-speaking community to be able to retrace their roots. And um, Nicolás was able to see the importance of this program and decided to go ahead and, and offer it. Um, he did mention that it was encouraging to see that people were interested in their roots and their heritage. And I, again, I think it was a really, really neat program that hopefully we'll be able to continue doing outside of Hispanic Heritage Month and be able to have it on an ongoing basis, which again, I feel like this is part of, in order for, for library systems to be able to succeed in programming, you have to be able to take a risk. And I think that's probably the hardest thing to convince your administration of is reassigning resources so that you can take a risk, a calculated risk on trying to do a program. And if the program works, being able to adapt that into an ongoing system. And if, and if the program doesn't work, that that's okay, that you're not wasting resources, you're learning from it so that you can improve and then move on to trying something else. Um, that's a good question, Martin. I, I, I know that we use Ancestry. I'm not entirely sure, uh, Nicolás, 
what you used in terms for the Spanish genealogy program. I'm sure he'll be able to answer that question. Um, I don't know if Ancestry is actually has any Spanish or if Nicolas just had to do some on the fly translation as he was doing the Spanish genealogy program. Um, next. So a couple of other collaborations that we had as well. Um, we have a, a K through uh, fifth grade services coordinator and they have this program called Book Explorers. Uh, the Book Explorer program is, it's a free program where um, school kids from kindergarten through fifth grade can just grab these bags that typically come with a book and a craft kit, and then they can take these home and read the book and then do a craft that is related to the, the book. So for particularly for Hispanic Heritage Month, we partnered with a community group called Museo de las Americas, and we had Carmen Lomas Garza, who is known for her colorful and detailed illustrations of memorable experiences um, with her family and their traditions. And they worked with Carmen to create the, the kit for, for kids to take home. So that was a really, also Museo de las Americas is, is a pr pretty prominent museum that is located in what, what is now known in Denver as the Santa Fe Arts District. Um, and so I, I would recommend, you know, if you're thinking about doing something like this to really do some research in your community to see if there is an organization out there like Museo where you could create some sort of artistic partnership. And then on the right hand side, we have portraits. Um, and so what we did for the portraits is we partnered with a local photographer called, uh, his name was Armando Geneiro, um, and they documented families in a formal studio. So he set everything up for families to be able to take these pictures, these family portraits. Um, but the little twist was that he worked with youth to give them the opportunity to, to capture their family's pictures. So while he set up the studio and everything, he kind of walked the, the, the teens that were interested in participating in this program, how to capture their, their families. Um, and this was the way that the artist way to celebrate Latino families uh, and provide a group of portraits to families who might not necessarily have the opportunity to, create, to have these family portraits taken. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide that for them. Uh, this this one was, I, so I participate, I, I want to preface by saying that Nadia and the uh, Hispanic Heritage Month planning group are the ones who did 99% of the work. Like they really worked so hard to create this amazing series. Um, I participated in a couple of them. You can see my picture on the top left in this cooking series, um, which I thought was a great idea. And when Nadia mentioned that this was one of the, the ideas they had from the group, I was like, sign me up, I'll do it. We'll make this happen. Where the idea was to grab a couple of staff members to be able to cook something that they brought from home. Um, I grew up in Argentina, so I chose to make empanadas uh, in a certain way that my mom used to make them when I was little. And I've brought that tradition over with me here in Denver. And the idea was to have staff members uh, record themselves while they were cooking. Uh, and we had our cooking series co consisted of making empanadas from Argentina, chumpe from El Salvador, arepas from Venezuela, and then Nadia did tamales from Mexico. And I had a lot of fun doing this. So we would make the empanadas, we would film them, and then we invited folks to come to one of our branches where we showed the video and then connected again, collaborating with a local restaurant. And in my case, we collaborated with Maria Empanada uh, to buy empanadas so that the participants could try the food. And I wish they could have tasted my empanadas because I'm very proud of them, but 
we, obviously we can't do that. Uh, and we, we have to follow all of our food regulations. So we have to buy that from, from a, a restaurant. But um, one of my most favorite memories from that program is a gentleman after the program was over, he came up and he was just so happy that we were able to share this with him. And he's like, this is my, this is the first time in my life that I'm trying an empanada. And that was just so much fun. Um, and this is probably, it can be a little, it's a fun program. This one could probably require a little bit of resources if you are connecting with a local restaurant to be able to provide that food, but it's definitely, um, I didn't really know what to expect when I when we when I signed up to do this, but for my empanada program, we had over 55, 60 people, and the the community really enjoyed it and loved it. And if there's one that you would like to try next year, I would definitely suggest trying to do a cooking series. I think we will be repeating the cooking. Yeah, not, not, Nadia is saying yes. Um, We'll, we'll have to use different chefs next time and, and change up the, the recipes a little bit. But folks love food. Food can help connect communities. We know that. Um, we love being able to provide food in our programs and it's definitely worthwhile. So the cooking series was kind of hybrid in the sense that we recorded the, the videos and they're up on our YouTube page. So if you, if you go to the Denver Public Library's YouTube page, you can see all four videos. And then it did have an in-person component where we showed the video of the cooking and then we just talked about empanadas in general and different cooking styles. And they would ask me what my favorite empanada was not thinking of Argentina, but what other empanadas I've tried. We talked about different types of empanadas um, and how some are savory and some are sweet. Um, and it was just, folks were just really engaged and some people shared their anecdotes of traveling to Argentina and tasting the empanadas. Um, yeah, so it, it had that double component where the, the, the cooking part was recorded and online, but then actual discussion of the cooking was done in person with samples from Maria Empanada. Um, and then the other thing that we do throughout the month is we adapt our story times and crafts. We, ongoing, we have ongoing story times happening every month, but what we try to do is be intentional about the books that we select when we're doing Hispanic Heritage Month to be able to select um, Latinx authors or Spanish or more, do more Spanish only story times. And again, this is something that I would, that I wish would be constantly happening throughout the year, not just focusing on it during Hispanic Heritage Month, but these things take time. These things are things that require an organizational cultural change. And the more that Nadia and folks like Nicolas can do these types of programs in Spanish, and the more our library staff and our library administration see the impact that it has in our community, then the more we'll be able to do this outside of Hispanic Heritage Month and just include this in a regular, regular programming series. A couple of other programs that we did, again, emph putting emphasis in the collaboration. On the left, we have the, the Bingo Musical, uh, which we do, we have a, again, Nadia. Nadia is the, the great collaborator and the, the one who makes all these connections within our community. It's very important that if you want to do this, I would suggest start going out to the community right now and building these relationships. The Bingo Musical, we do it at a, at a Hispanic brewery called Cer uh, Raices, Cerveceria Raices. Um, and we've collaborated with them in the past. They have a very, very big space that can accommodate a lot of people. Um, they allow us to use the space for free. Their equipment is, is set. They have all the equipment set up for this type of performance where we can, what we do is we, Nadia created a list of musical videos that we play for five, 10 seconds. And then we print out bingo cards for everyone with the names of those music videos and those music, those artists. Um, and we just have the songs playing on a loop 
and you know people shout bingo we have some it's totally free uh what's great about doing something like this at a brewery is that you might have some folks that go to the brewery uh for the for the library event because they read about this but you're also going to engage with a lot of people that had no idea that this was happening but realize that it's so much fun that they weren't expecting to go have a beer play bingo and win a prize or win a $25 gift card to the brewery. And I think that's part also of, of how we can make successful programs is finding, going to where the folks are. They, they probably didn't go here specifically for the bingo musical, but for sure they left thinking that if this happens again, they will come to this program. This is all a hundred percent free. Um, and Another thing that we didn't do this year, but it's something that we could do next year, we typically do this for another program called Winter of Reading, is engaging with breweries or other restaurants where folks show their library card, they can get um, a discount off their menu. That's something that also helps build relationships with community partners. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have a memory cafe, which is another program that the library does once a week. Um, for, you know, older adults who are experiencing memory loss and for Hispanic Heritage Month, we collaborated with, uh, we have an older adults program coordinator. Her name is Amy Delpo and she runs these memory cafes. So what we did for this one is we played Loteria um, and, you know, just changed it up a little bit from what they're used to doing every week um, and created a fun Loteria event for them to, to just, you know, be able to to play and explained about, you know, the, the history of Loteria, because it's not just about showing up and saying, we're going to play Loteria, but giving some context and some meaning in the history of, you know, where Loteria comes from and all, all that stuff. And it was pretty fun seeing older adults who maybe like they have never even been familiar with any word in Spanish and they were trying to repeat the words that were saying, you know, el diablito, la rana. Uh, so it was pretty fun being there with them. Uh, um, other of the activities we did was Loteria Mexicana. Uh, back in April, when we were not doing in-person programming, the Spanish customer experience team, we have a team for, to offer good customer experience. And the older adult services department came together to offer a game of Loteria Mexicana online. And it was very popular, but we were not reaching the community we wanted to reach um, because it was, geared towards older adults who spoke Spanish and they are less li likely to access online resources, events, and programs. Mm. So as soon as the library gave us the green light to switch to in-person programming, we switched to in-person programming to do mm, uh, Loteria Mexicana in one of the branches every month. Now we're doing two every month. But for Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, we offer some branches to host some Loteria games and the results were great. Um, you can see here in the picture uh, is what we're trying to reach, older adults who speak Spanish uh, coming together and winning some of those cute prizes that we had there. That many of them were like not as interested in the prizes as uh, they were just happy to be there with their, their community. Mm, we had uh, six branches doing Loteria games. Uh, one of them even did a Lucha Libre Loteria game. They created their own Loteria uh, with the pictures of uh, luchadores and it was, it was pretty fun. Uh, but it, this, this was thanks to the Spanish customer experience team and the older adult services team who were able to come together to offer the services. Mm. 
And on your left, you can see this band. This band is called Los Mocochetes. They're a Chicano local band um, who play music in English and Spanish. We asked them to only play in Spanish for this event, and they did. They did some slam poetry, and they, 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 they really bring the dance within you out. And I don't like to dance, but they, they, they bring, yeah, they bring, they bring that up to you. And so we are opening a new library in, the, in an area called Art Park. And this area has different organizations in it. They have a, the Red Line Arts, they have the Zine Library, and there was a grand opening for the actual area, not for the library. So we wanted to bring some, like a touch of Hispanic Heritage Month to the event. So we hired the Plus Mocochetes to bring some Chicano music, the Chicano music uh, in Spanish. And we also had paletas. Uh, the paletas were very popular too. You guys can um, wanna do some events. This is pretty fun for the kids. Mm, they usually rent, uh, you can buy the paletas and they let you borrow the cart to bring it with you. Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you for those questions. Yes, Michelle. Um, we, this time we didn't do any uh, surveying except for older adults, um, but it wasn't the work. It just came up super late and we didn't have time to do it. Mm, another promise for next year. And there is a comment that the Loteria has problems with to some of the depictions in the cards. Uh, the new Loterias, they come already changed. Mm, the, some of the illustrations that are a little, that are not culturally sensitive were changed. We have two new pictures on them. One is El Molcajete and the other one is El Trompo. And those two images replaced El Borracho and El Negrito. So if you go to a store or if you order them online, probably the ones you're gonna buy are gonna be the new, the new versions without those two uh, depictions. <laughs> Millennial Lottery, yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's pretty fun too. Oh, I, I, also the mermaid, the sirena, uh, it used to be, it used to be more graphic. Now the sirena is wearing a top. So you can buy it and you can have kids playing too. Mm. And this one of the biggest events we had, uh, in order to do this, uh, we had to partner with Teatro Aztlán. Uh, Aztlán Theater is a historic place in the Santa Fe Art District. It's owned by a couple, an older couple. Uh, the owner's name is Tim Correa. And he's about 90 years old and he still works the bar every first Friday when, we, when they open. And his wife is in the early 80s as well and she helps at the bar too. Mm. The As Aslan Theater has two sections. One is a bar section, the other one is the theater. They hadn't opened the theater in a long time. And the musician we had played the, there, he had played at the bar before and he had never played at the theater. They let us use the theater for free just because they wanted to support the library. And we just had to pay the performers, but uh, uh, the, the theater was free. It was very successful. Um, in that photo, you can see Nicanor. He's eating an empanada from Chile. Um, it's not an empanada from Argentina. That's why he looks a little mad, but they were really good. Uh, so we offer a little of everything. We offer uh, free music and entertainment, and we offer free food. We had nachos, we had empanadas from Chile, and people who came to the event, 
they only had to buy their own drinks. So I think that was good for also the owners of the theater. Mm, the music we had playing that night was music from Chile. That's why we decided to get empanadas from Chile too. Uh, people were dancing, people were having fun. We had a resource table that Nicanor was staffing. And we had the communications department helping us promote it through the event, through our social media, and also on our two publications that we have. Um, we have one publication in Spanish, it's called Conexiones. And we have one publication in English, it's called Engage. And we have them come in every first of the month. And they had like events and articles that our own staff can write. And so everything that was going on at the library. Uh, we also have some newsletters that people get in the mail. <clears throat> and those are English only for now. So hopefully next year we can have something in Spanish as well. Mm. Yes, and I'm gonna go to this Calaveras de Azúcar um, slide. This Calaveras de Azúcar program was done thanks to our partnership with Metro State University of Denver and the Journey to Our Heritage team. Um, we have been partnered with them for about four or five years and they always help us bring programming that is like related through our Hispanic heritage. That's why, that's why the name Journey to Our Heritage. Mm. So thanks to them, we were able to offer uh, Calaveras de Azúcar program. Mm. It was very popular. It was so popular that we had to turn people away at the end because we ran out of about 150 Calaveras de Azúcar we have for participants. Mm. Uh, in partnership with them, we also offer uh, some uh, La Llorona related program. And we had different storytellers coming to tell stories. I told the story, the community uh, was able to like volunteer to come and tell us a story. Uh, Nicolas, again, he was here. He also told us a story that he wrote. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this partnership with Journey to Our Heritage from Metro uh, Denver it has been very successful. Actually, tomorrow we have a book uh, opening, a book reception uh, from local authors, and we are partnering with them as well. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so I hope we were able to convey some of the, the collaborative aspects that made this Hispanic Heritage Month. In my view, such a success, there's still a little bit more work that we need to do in order to wrap this up. Um, a part of the final steps are for Nadia to reach out to library staff members through our uh, staff web, which is our intranet, and allow uh, staff members to provide feedback on this process so then we can take that feedback and improve for next year. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the evaluation process and the library system. DPL right now is in a place where we're trying to implement better evaluation practices and we're using a survey tool called Alchemer to be able to do that and we're actually hiring a new data person. <laughs> that's not the technical term, but that's how I remember it. Um, so definitely for next year, we will be able to, to be a little bit more, focus more on the evaluation part since we've been able to figure out the programming part this year. And um, yeah, we'll open it up to, to questions and comments now. Nicanor, I see a question in the chat. How supportive is your library commission or board of your efforts? Um, they're very supportive. One of the things that we didn't talk about in this presentation because we didn't really know how to fit it in is 
one of the things that the library has done over the last 20, 20 years is uh, a Latino Community Service Awards. And these awards take place during Hispanic Heritage Month. And we put together a, a committee that reviews nominations and nominees. And we have library board commissions in that committee. So we, Im I, I don't wanna say we involve them in Hispanic Heritage Month programming because all the work that we do is mo mostly for the library, but they are involved in Hispanic Heritage Month programming through the Latino Community Service Awards. So they recognize that this is an important thing that the library should be doing and um, they participate through those awards. And I mean, it also helps that um, our board, I'm not sure if he's the president now, but I know he was the president, but he's still in the, in the library board. Carlos Martinez is um, the founder of the Latino Forum here in, in Colorado, or he's the direct, he's very involved with Latino Forum. So they, they know, that this is very important for the library to be able to provide these programs for Spanish speaking communities. So they're totally on board. And there was a, a follow up, well, several other questions. Do your friends help fund these programs? No. Um, however, I will say that we haven't asked for funding from them. Um, they haven't offered, but we haven't asked, but it could be, I don't know that we need to ask them for funding. Um, maybe, maybe we can test this theory out next year and reach out to them to see if they would be interested in sponsoring maybe some of, some of the events at Raices, um, or maybe even if we do something else again at the Estelon Theater to be able to um, provide some, some compensation to the owner for allowing us to use the space. Uh, and we can report back again next year how that interaction goes with our Friends Foundation. That sounds great. Maybe we'll have you next year then. We'll do this every year. Update. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions. Uh, what percentage of your staff, your board, and your community are Latinx, Latina, Latino, or Hispanic? Uh, from the board... I think off the top of my head, unless Nadia is looking at the website right now, I want to say that maybe we have one or two members. Um, one, Carlos, Carlos Martinez. Um, as from staff, I want to say because we've lost a lot of staff members, and, and I think the majority of the staff members that we lost were probably Spanish speaking staff members. I think at one point we had about 140 Spanish speaking staff members out of 600 and we're probably at a, hovering at around 100 right now, um, which was a pretty big blow for the library system. There is one branch that I started working at the library, the Athmar Park branch, where, where I started, there were six Spanish speaking staff members at the branch and right now we're down to just one. So that has definitely taken a hit. Um, in the staffing size area. And I can, if, if my memory serves me from the last census, I think about 38% of the Denver community um, identifies as Hispanic or Latino. Uh, so it's a pretty big chunk of the community. And obviously our staff needs to reflect that. So we definitely need to have about four, two, two to 250 staff members um, if not more, and definitely more representation in our administration as well. So a follow-up to that for students or even recent alumni or recent graduates, do you have any job openings right now? We do, we okay. do have job openings. Um, and we're gonna be hiring more librarians. Um, but yeah, if, if any of you that are on the list are interested in applying for any of the jobs that DPL has opening, um, my email address is on there. I welcome you to reach out to me, set up a, a Google Meets or a Zoom meeting. I'm happy to talk to you about the position, about some of the expectations, um, try to give you as much information as I can for you to be able to make an informed decision whether this is the place where you wanna work or not. Obviously we would love to have 
the more Spanish speakers we can have in our library system, the better. Um, but I am happy to, to, to have a conversation with anyone who's interested in pursuing employment with the Denver Public Library. Thank you, Nicanor. I have one of my own questions. Um, I know we talked about you know, successes here, but I'm curious about one, if there was any resistance, uh, maybe amongst staff or even community partners, or even your, your communities you serve, or any obstacles you faced. And I'm sure with each of the programs, there might've been something, but is there anything that stood out to you that really was a true obstacle that presented challenges in any of these programs? I have a thought, but I want to know. I want to see if Nadia um, wants to share from her experience first. Uh, I personally uh, help or support or plan more most of the events this month, and everybody was very willing to help, support, and participate in being part of this effort. Mm, I didn't encounter any like uh, blocks on the road to do this at all. So it was fairly, yes, it was, but it was fairly smooth. Um, we, you know, we didn't get any backlash from, uh, I personally with the work that I was doing and I didn't get any backlash from any, any part of the communities that didn't agree with celebrating this. And I see uh, Nicholas made a comment about the library card design was tricky. Wanted to do a contest with the community, but because of time constraints, using staff designs instead. Well, maybe next year, plan ahead and there'll be more time and then the community can be involved. Uh, are there other questions? I don't, I think we got every question in the chat and I don't have other questions. You've addressed all of mine. Uh, uh, Nicolas, I think the design with the flags was very well liked. It was the favorite of everybody. Definitely, definitely. Um, really quickly to add to your last question, Michelle. Our library system from uh, the time that we posted that horrible Facebook post from Engage to where we are today has grown so much the the community the marketing department the staff that made that post happen from the community department no longer work with the denver public library um and oftentimes some of the obstacles that we had would come from that particular department in the sense that they wouldn't want to promote programs they didn't want to give us flexibility to um create our own promotional designs and they also were very much, we had some issues doing some translation work as well around our, our programming. Uh, and they were very much a department that was like, no, 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 we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna do this. We're not gonna do this. Um, after that, we hired a new director for community communications and community engagement. Her name is Erica Martinez. Uh, and she really helped to turn that department around to a collaborative department where this idea of the library cards, we would have not been able to do that three years ago because the department would have said kind of this message that probably other folks here, no, we're not going to spend our resources on that. It's not worth it. We like that. That's not what we're here for. So what our, our current communications and marketing department will say is like, yes, let's give it a try. Let's print, let's buy 10,000 10, cards and see how it goes. And then, you know, if it doesn't go well, fine, we'll, we'll improve for next year. But they're willing to take that risk, which I think is always going to be the first step in creating these successful programs and connecting with our communities. Thank you, Nicanor. I think, too, you know, there's always, you know, change is a constant and there's always room for improvement. Um, what you've really highlighted or what I've heard today, it's about community. Who is your community? How can you really provide valuable, um, insightful, highlighting programs that really connect with your communities, but also the importance and the value of the 
partnerships and collaborating, whether it's internal or external agencies or community partners out there to ensure you have successful programs and making it where it's of value to the community beyond even the library. So Denver as a whole, going beyond even maybe your local city. So I really appreciate that message that came through for me and tying it to culture and our heritage and who we are. Um, so great work. Are there other questions or comments? We have just a few minutes. I just have one last comment. Um, our new marketing manager, um, at the beginning, uh, last year, we made a mistake on one of our flyers when we translated. Uh, so the flyer came out really bad. And I told her, I don't think you should go out to the public. And she said, you're right. Equity is expensive and we're gonna pay the price. So that's, I think that's a new, uh, a new model that the communications department has been taking uh, to support our efforts. That's Fair great. Day. That's great. Um, yeah. Anthony, I'm going to turn it over to you if you want to wrap us up. Great. Actually, I do have a question. So we were, uh, Nick and Nora and, and Nadia, for you, we were talking before the session about kind of that moment of truth where um, oftentimes libraries are in a situation where they're not really connected very well with the community. Therefore, the resources that they do have are not being used very well. And then oftentimes it's easy to justify not putting more resources into it because we have that situation. So um, could you both speak to maybe uh, library directors or library systems that hopefully will watch this video or, or are in attendance now? How do, how, do you, how do you commit and how do you break that little vicious cycle uh, between lack of usage, therefore not putting more resources into it in order to, meet, to actually meet the needs of the community? Yeah, um, I think I think there's a couple of things that if if a library director is watching this that they should consider. I think first and foremost is that they should trust their staff members. Nadia is the person who is out in the community and building those connections. So if she comes to me and says, Nick and or I need money to do this program, I'm not going to question her. Um, I've hired her to do a job. She's doing the job, and I'm going to place trust that she knows what's best and that she's done her homework and she's connected with the community. Um, and I would invite library directors and library managers to participate in these programs, to attend the events that their staff are planning, to be able to, if I wouldn't have gone to the Estelan Theater, the closing, I wouldn't have seen the relationship that Nadia had, not only with the owner of the theater, but also with the band that was playing. It was, it was a friendly relationship. It was a relationship of collaboration. They back each other up, that they know how important this is for the library. And I was able to see that because I volunteered to participate in the event. And that's unbelievably important for library directors to be able to see this. And also to understand that it's going to take some time and you have to divert resources. And it's not a one time only program. Nobody showed up, we're never doing this again. It takes time to do the first program, to get that word of mouth for the first program. Your customers, your participants will double next year and then double and continue to grow. You have to put some work into it and you have to dedicate resources. Wonderful. Nadia, any, any thoughts? Uh, yes, of course. Um, especially for public libraries, remember we are getting paid with taxpayers' money to serve the community. So you have to serve the community. It's like a, our ethical responsibility to do that. That's fantastic. Well, so in conclusion, uh, I wanna thank uh, everyone, uh, Michelle, Nikanor, Nadia in particular for your um, expertise and participation. Um, this is uh, the iSchool uh, with great pride is uh, sponsoring this again to provide these very important conversations. Uh, and so, um, I think it's a good way to conclude this uh, conversation and Hispanic Heritage Month in, in that really what we were talking about in the end is return on investment, right? What are you investing uh, in order to expect the return, right? And I think that that really is a very, very poignant, uh, Nikanor and, and Nadia. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and since Michelle uh, kind of helped 
uh, put all this together. Michelle, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, and, uh, and gracias. Oh, thank you. Gracias a todos. Um, thank you everyone for attending. And I, I really a shout out to Nicanor and Nadia for all of the great work you're doing, the ideas, and hopefully for those that listen or are here today can capture some of them and try to replicate or adopt, I would say, and adapt to their own communities. So thank you again for your expertise. We appreciate both of you and all of your support with, with this, this program today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.